Torre, I was thinking, if where do you find the time were a person, it would be my main man, Torre. Um, you are easily, easily the most productive and prolific pop culture pundit on the planet. <laughs> um, you are your one man news network. I realize uh, you're probably posting some right now. You probably multi. This is how you do it. What, what, what are you posting right now? What are you posting not, as, 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 I'm posting, as I'm giving you I'm flowers? Not, I'm not posting for that. I'm, I was just texting one of my producers on my podcast. Um, but no, you know, it's funny you say that because that there's there's I mean, the key. There's the secret. OK, I was going to ask you, how are you a one man news network? Because I realize well, I don't need CNN. I don't need MSNBC. I don't need Twitter. Well, I do need Twitter to follow you. I need Instagram to follow you because all I got to do is follow Torrey's social feed. And I know everything I need to know about everything you were saying. Go ahead. No, you know, one of the things that's really important to me is planning. And every Sunday I sit down and think about you know, what are the short-term goals and needs and what are the long-term goals and needs? And okay. what am I doing this week each day on the, the long-term and the short-term goals? And I think for a lot of people, it's easy to keep the short-term goals in mind because there's deadlines that are right around the corner. But if you also have long-term goals, you need to make sure that you are checking in and Am I working on my long-term goals now? Am I pushing that? You know, it's going to take me, you know, let's say 18 months to write a book. But I need to peck away at it each week while I'm also making my boss happy or whatever the case may be. So, you know, and, and it's not just professional. It's also, you know, what am I doing for my tennis? Am I taking care of the things I need to take care of my kids? I'm making sure that, you know, I gave my wife something that she needed, like time she needed, whatever. So I map out schedule for the week, trying to take in a, okay, I do not have time to work on my book this week, but I'll make sure I get back to it next week. But this week I'm going to work on the podcast and then the this and that. Okay. And, you know, so, you know, so you, I, I'm just sort of going into the week aware that I'm working on the short-term goals and the long-term goals. And, hmm. you know, the schedule can change by the day, but I have a plan. And if I'm not planning to think about the long-term goals, then they will get lost in the shuffle. I think it's very easy for your long-term goals to get lost in the shuffle unless you are checking in with them and asking yourself, am I dealing with my long-term goals this week? That's fascinating and that's right where i wanted to go in general with you in this conversation man about about your process now you should need no introduction but for those that may not know you are currently um a host and the creative director and a creative director at the grio as well as uh the host of Torre show one of my favorite mm -hmm. podcasts uh yeah. an eight-time author and a book coach so we're gonna unpack all of that uh, before the end of this conversation. But you mentioned your tennis. I do want to start with you there because that's what you just finished doing. You just came off the tennis court and you play tennis every day. I just found this out about you, uh, even though we've known each other for literally years and you knew my wife yeah, before yeah. that. But you play tennis yeah. every day, but it's really not a game to you, tennis. No, no. It's more no, than no. just we, a game. No, we, we serious with it, you know, um... No, I'm very serious. I play a bunch of tournaments every year, five, six, seven tournaments every year. Um, you know, I mean, I've been playing tennis since I was six, grew up playing tournaments, and the, the experience of thinking about your game and what can I improve in my game and what aspects, t small aspects, do we need to change to be more efficient, to be more thoughtful, to be whatever, like that makes it and that that drive that experience of like just putting another brick in there and figuring out I, I find that really really exciting you know today for example i was thinking about something that you know one of the guys i work with was talking about before you serve you should think about where you want to hit the first ball so that there's no 
mental load. There's no decision to be made. You just execute. The ball comes. I already decided the first ball is going to go cross court. So then I don't have a moment of thinking, where am I going to hit this ball? I'm immediately lining up to hit it cross court. So removing that mental load makes it easier to make that first shot. So, you know, and I hadn't really thought about that until I started talking to higher level guys who were like, this is this is how you handle that situation. So, I mean, you know, trying to institute that, you know, just trying to just trying to just, you know, it becomes smaller things as you get higher and higher. You know, don't move your feet on your serve, you know, turn your shoulders on the return of serve. What ha all, you know, all these sort of little things and just just the drive to just make your game just a little bit better every day is really exciting to me. You started playing when you were six, you said. Who put the racket in your hand and who's inspired you over the years? Yeah. My dad, my dad. I remember him coming home. He was way into it in the 70s. Uh, he played into his 80s, um, always singles, never doubles. He hated doubles. Um, <laughs> I remember he called and said, I'm coming home with a very special gift. And I'm like, yo, this is going to be some Batman car or something. <laughs> Great. And he had this little wooden green and white racket for juniors. And I was like, this is not special. Now, it was probably the most special thing that he ever gave me. But at the time, I didn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. um, and we started taking classes at, um, at the club that he was a part of. Now, this club is nothing like what you would imagine if I said I grew up at a tennis club. Imagine, mm. you know, like like the 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 this was a not for profit club in the hood in in uh Dorchester in, in, right near Mattapan in Boston. In Boston for those that don't know, yeah, exactly. Most of the people who played there, or taking lessons there, were black. A lot of them were uh, working class projects, what have you. So, you know, it, it didn't cost much to get on to to play, and for juniors, it cost very little. I think it would be, would be like a hundred or two hundred for a summer camp, and the summer camp is like you know nine to five, five days a week, right? Because the whole the whole mission was. We're going to put some of these, take some of these kids from the projects, you know, teach them how to play tennis, get a tennis scholarship, get into a good school and transform mm -hmm. their lives. And, you know, we were, we were middle class, but we were part of that whole thing. Um, so, I mean, this was a very black environment. It was very fun. Uh, I, I, I watched Soul Train with the kid, with all the rest of the kids. They, like, there was a TV in the, lobby and mm -hmm. 11 o'clock on Saturdays we're all sitting there watching Soul Train and then at 12 o'clock we go out and play some more um so you know it was a fun funky very black experience um but you know we learned that Arthur Ashe came through uh after I left Venus came through I hit with James Blake there once which was hmm. incredible uh you know hitting with James Blake was interesting because you know, we only had half the court and he was at the net at this moment uh, when I jumped in to hit with him. And I'm hitting and I'm like, you know, you superstar. I think he was top five, six in the world, something like that. Like, let me let me let me just see. Let me just push him a little bit. Just just to yeah. see. I just want, I want to see it. Let me see. I want, you know, like like Kobe with Jordan. Like, let me, I want to see it. Um, right. I'm at the baseline and I start hitting the ball really hard at him, you know. And and he's just volleying it without even moving his feet, you know. Yeah. Total poise. This is nothing, you know. You you know you you've upped the pace. This is nothing. No, but you know, it's like you know, it's just you know the kid. The guy's just beautiful with it. Um, yeah. I remember too, because I'm always thinking about cardio. You know, being have enough stamina for the. You know, I was like, yo, do you run? He was like, why would you run a mile? When do we ever run a mile? Like, yeah. don't run a mile to practice huh. for tennis. We run huh. three, four steps at a time. Six, if you run six steps for the ball, that's a long way. Tennis is a lot of stop-start, so it's a lot of mm. lactic acid, 
right? Run a couple steps, stop, got to run the other direction, stop, run the other direction. So, you know, like short steps that, and then yeah. stops that like, you know, it's like, that's, that's yeah. what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So you got to prepare for that. Uh, so he, you know, he reminded me, he really focused me on, on that. I had been running for cardio and he's like, no, why would you know, Interesting. Don't do that? Cause so, it's yeah. funny you say that. Cause I, cause I, uh, dare I say, I have a better win percentage in tennis than you do Torre, because I am one and oh all time because <laughs> I played for like a semester in high school, because I, I I played high school football, and by played I mean I was on the team, if you know what I mean, right? What did you play? Um, what was your position? I was a quarterback. Come on, man, you know that. Uh, backup I, quarterback I, I, mostly. You know, okay. I mean, I don't, I don't. I, I, come on, what do you think? I, I was a scream quarterback. I mean, I think about me, but I was the backup, so you know, let's just be real. I was, you know, who I was? I was Mox in Varsity Blues. That was like me except black, but that was me. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, James Vanderbeek's character. No, what okay. I was gonna say was, I I did tennis. I tried tennis for one semester in New Orleans in high school at McDonald Thirty Five, and the people that don't understand, tennis kicks your ass physically, like yeah. pretty much no other sport. Only sport, only practice that I would put up against is track, but like fo football practice ain't has shit on tennis. So I had one match. I managed to win that one match, and I put that racket down. I would prefer football practice in the heat of New Orleans any day to, to tennis. That tests your endurance like nobody's business. You remind me of two experiences. Um, I ran into Eddie George at a yeah. airport once, at an airport bar. We had a really nice conversation. And one of the things he said was that in a football game, for him, it's actually five minutes of actual football the entire game hmm. but yeah. that is the physically hardest five minutes that you will right. ever experience and right. and linking to that when uh tom brady and draymond were on lebron's show right mm -hmm. and and tom was like Draymond, you guys got it easy. The weather's always nice and nobody's trying to take your head off. <laughs> and Draymond's like, yeah, that's cool, but y'all take a five-minute break every 10 seconds. Right. Like, You're only playing one side of the ball. <laughs> we are you... yeah, there, that too. We are, I yeah. mean, Draymond and them are running up and down yeah. the court like crazy, yeah. you know, like a solid 15 minutes. You I know. play basketball too. I, I Just tennis, man. It's a different beast. Well, one of the things also – because one of the great experiences in my life, I did a story that didn't run for Vogue where I went to mm -hmm. Florida and I hung out with Jennifer Capriotti for two days. And I, I and I asked and asked and asked and begged. And finally she let me hit with her for five minutes. Okay. And, you know, if you sit real close at the US Open or whatever, you can see the speed of the ball, but you can't perceive the weight of the ball right? Mm. Until you are receiving it. I'm at the other baseline. I was never late on the ball, which I mean, I'm always out in front hitting with her for five minutes, right? If somebody hits yeah. the ball really hard, to you, you're not prepared, then you're going to meet it behind your hip. So you're late. So the ball's probably going to go off to the side instead of straight ahead, right? So she's not hitting it so fast that I was late. I'm always able to be in the right position. But her ball is so heavy that my mm. forearm is throbbing and I feel like I'm hitting it underwater and like really got to mm. use my whole arm and shoulder and body to just get it back because it's like this just weighted ball that's coming at you. And that helped me further understand the challenge that's going on at the professional level, that they're getting their whole yeah. body and their whole weight into the ball yeah. and that well, it's very, very difficult to get back. Um, I also, by the way, maybe I didn't tell you the story. I, I once beat Eli Manning head to head in high school, but that's a conversation for a different day. This is about you. Uh, in, in, <laughs> I'll, I'll, in, in football, in what sport? Yeah. Football. In, in, Eli, in, you know, in what? In running? Football. A game. I was the quarterback what aspect of, football? of the team. Bruh, why are you sleeping on your boy? Like, I, I listen, I, I, I was the backup quarterback Eli most Manning, of the dog. time. It, it, ask him, it happened. 
<laughs> it's Rob Nelson. Sure why why would I lie? He was, dead. he was a freshman and I was a senior, which to me equals out because he was a Manning. Okay. okay. 19, <laughs> fall of 1996, on the road, in the rain, a hostile environment at Newman High School, at Isidore Newman High School in New Orleans, had all Wait, kinds of people chanting my name. I played. I, I threw the. Torre, I threw the game. Look, man, if you can hit with James Blake and Jennifer Capriati, why can't I beat Eli Manning in an actual high school football game? It happened. Well, I'm, I'm, so I'm not... that we were trailing again on the road, hostile environment. We we're trailing seven and nothing. I threw the game winning touchdown pass to one corner of the end zone. And, well, excuse me, the touchdown pass to the one corner of the end zone, and then the game winning two point conversion to the other part of the end zone. And then, see, I wasn't even gonna get into all this, but you're pulling it out of me since you asked. Then we met at midfield, and because all the cameras matter. in the media was around us and whatnot, you know how they try to like lip, read lips and whatnot, and they want to know what I was saying. I whispered in his ear, and I was like, yo, man, just keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right track. If you ever need anything, hit me up. And that was how the legend Eli Manning was born, quite honestly, because he saw that, how to be clutch for me. He that's saw, what that's said. what I, Zach, I, I told him. I was like, listen, you will learn from this experience. Like, you will be better from this. Like, I know this hurts right now, me beating you in this preseason game in 1996 as a freshman, but you will never forget this. And if you ask Eli Manning to this day, he will tell you that that's where he learned how to be clutch. So, really, I'm the reason why Tom Brady doesn't have more Super Bowls. If you really want to, like, actually, your ninth book can be about how Eli Manning learned to be a champion. And how Michael Smith actually rewrote history, if you really want to break it down. See, because what I'm doing right now, and I'll get to this later, I'm breaking this down the same way you broke down the songs that spoke to the issues of the 1980s. Because, like, the rabbit hole you took me down, woo, well, but I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to get back to that. But we're on tennis. So we've established not only your love of tennis, but your knowledge of the game. Which is why I don't think there's anybody better for me to talk to about what Novak Djokovic just did, Ooh. passing Rafa Ooh. Nadal with a record, an open era record, 23 singles, major titles. Okay, well, and he's, he's also he's the first tied guy. With Serena. He, he's, he's tied, tied with, with Serena, Serena now, but, but he's but they actually trail Margaret Court technically, technically. But I'm he's not, also the no, first guy. Well, just technically, really she, well, it wasn't the open error. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just putting the facts out there. I don't, I don't count what Mark yeah, reports. Yeah, I'm just That's putting the facts really out there. Different. But he is the first guy with the, uh, what, do you, what do they call it? The triple the, the, the triple slam. Like, he's got three of each. Um, yeah. He's the first guy with, with three of each slam. So it's just a testament to his versatility. But what I want to say, what I want to ask you about, though, is uh, one of your more recent Instagram posts, I never thought I would hear this coming from you. But not only did you declare Djokovic to be the greatest men's player, but for you, he's past Serena. Yeah. Expound, please. I mean, you know, Djokovic has created the greatest resume in tennis history against the greatest competition. He's part of the greatest generation in tennis and he was the dominant figure he has more slams than Federer and Nadal a head-to-head mm -hmm. -head, a winning head-to-head -head record against both of them and more weeks at number one than anybody else and he accomplished all this in the era of Federer and Nadal he is the yeah. third one to emerge on the elite stage out of those three. And once it was nine to one at one point in yeah. terms of majors in favor of Nadal to Djokovic. Yeah, I mean, that and also, you know, Federer cakes up at a relatively weaker period. That's not his fault. But the when when Nadal and Djokovic are there, Federer's slam uh, winning is far less than before when he's dealing with Leighton Hewitt and Andy Roddick and some of these other folks. Um, mm -hmm. Djokovic has had uh, the most incredible 12 year period the last 12 years. And yeah. if he wasn't stupid about COVID, he might probably have a couple more. Um, yeah. You know, if he hadn't, you know, just hit a ball in anger at the U S open, he might have another one and he's 37 
and he is the overwhelming favorite at Wimbledon. Will be the right. favorite. He can, he can now be at the U.S. Open. Open. Yeah. Yes, and the Australian. I mean, like it, it, he he was extraordinary as a let's say in the prime of his life sort of guy. And now he's doing the Tom Brady, LeBron thing right. of like beating, young, beating younger dudes, so, <laughs> right. I mean, Out, the, outlasting the, younger guys. Yes. The globe has had the globe a decade to find somebody to mess with Djokovic and still hasn't found that person. And, you know, yeah. football is, is not a global sport. Basketball has become more of a global sport. Right. But football is not right. Baseball is more a little bit more, but football is not, um, you know, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, we are we are getting tennis players for pretty much from every continent. Right. Africa is still coming. But, you know, Europe, Australia, obviously, America, South America, Asia. Djokovic is still killing them. Best backhand ever. Best return ever. But the movement around the court is what really kills me. I think that mm -hmm. the way that he moves, his court is two feet wider than anyone else in terms of, I can get to balls this wide, on balance, make a solid, you know, make a solid shot, a solid return, and get back in the court. So his his ability, his playing field is wider than anybody else's. It's it's yeah. ridiculous. But there are some people that that could, you can make an argument for some people in terms of some of the subtleties of his game. Like maybe you want to debate somebody else's return game or movement or whatever. But what is not debatable, and I think it was uh, wasn't Andy Roddick that said this. I forget I forget whose line it was, but somebody said of of, of Djokovic. First, he takes your legs, then he takes your soul. Have you seen a mentally tougher tennis player than Novak Djokovic? It's fitting that Brady was in his box and that you brought up Tom Brady and, what the, and how they defeat in Father Time. I mean, obviously, Serena's got that. But, like, from a mental toughness standpoint, he takes the cake. I mean, Djokovic has been extraordinarily tough mentally. It's very inspiring. Nadal and Federer have also been guys who, and Serena too, have been people who, you know, match point down, troubles, a looming, and they're still freaking like just flying straight and hard and like right and you know, no, no concern, just, just going for, you know, like Marines or something like they're just ridiculous. Just, you know, the thing with, with with Federer with Djokovic, like I said, he's doing it against Federer and Nadal. So he's building the greatest resume ever against mm -hmm. two of the greatest players ever. My top five all time is one Djokovic, two Serena, three Federer, four Nadal. So he's mm -hmm. he's doing you know like like if LeBron caked up, if LeBron against were beating Jordan, Jordan and Kareem, Kobe. <laughs> Yeah, right? okay, yeah. Like, right, like yeah. They, they're all I like that. at the same like time. That. And LeBron, <laughs> yeah. you know, and Serena yeah. had an incredible career. She has no rivals. So if you want to make the case that, like, well, That's Serena's so greater than everyone else that she she's far ahead of her Federer and Nadal. Yeah. Hey, yeah. That's an interesting case. I, I, I don't know about that. I think Serena's right. career is unbelievable and inspiring and amazing. Yeah. She's extremely ordinary player and, right. it takes and she represents something completely play. different right right yes. she's she transcends and, and tennis in a way that Djokovic does not yes and I would put her at number two all time uh, you know it, but like you know what Djokovic has accomplished is unbelievable and he's not done I mean like you mentioned he'll be the favorite at Wimbledon he'll be the favorite at the US Open he make it the calendar slam um and I mean does he does he threaten 30 is, can you put it past him? I mean, I know that seems ridiculous. He just got 23 I mean, at the French, but I mean, like he doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. I mean, you know, it be it, it you know, 25 a year from now is completely reasonable, and you start to wonder: Is this guy gonna put the number of slams all time at a number that nobody's gonna be able to catch? You right. know, it's. It's 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 unbelievable. 
So I want to talk about another Joker, the other Joker, uh, Nikola Jokic, um, who just you want to talk about on fire right now, bruh. You want to talk about um, a club to be in? Now that the Nuggets have won the finals in five, Nikola Jokic, finals MVP, first NBA player. So this is a club of one. First NBA player to ever lead all players in postseason points, rebounds, and assists. But here's where it gets good. He's one of 11 players with two MVPs and a finals MVP. Joining Jordan, LeBron, Kareem, Wilt, Magic, Bird, Moses, Giannis, Steph, and Tim Duncan. Those are guys with two MVPs and a finals MVP. But I want to go back to something. Because I mentioned, man, you're so prolific. Um, you like the Hamilton line. You, you write like you're running out of time. Um, <laughs> you, wrote, you wrote a column for the Griot back in March that you and I have never discussed. And you weighed in on the, a, a discussion that really irked me that was happening on television and on Twitter about whether or not there was racial bias in the NBA MVP voting, which, as we know, eventually went to – Joel Embiid, but it was a pretty contentious debate about Jokic and whether or not he was deserving of a third straight MVP, not just because he hadn't achieved anything in the postseason, which, oh, by the way, neither has Joel Embiid, and because of the legacy of people who had won three straight and did he belong in that club at the time. It looks real silly to me in hindsight, that, uh, that, that criticism. But as you pointed out, no black player had done that in 50 years. The only player to do it was Larry Bird was winning three straight. Now, before I ask you how you feel about that now, I just want to say this. What I love about the column, and I I highly suggest everybody go back and read it because it still holds up, is much like most of your work, you use it as a teachable moment. You weren't talking as much about the merits or lack thereof of Nikola Jokic, but more so just about whiteness points and how... First of all, and I agree with this wholeheartedly, racism and race permeates every sector and every aspect of American society. That's one. Uh, but two, it's like in every walk of life, white people get extra credit. It, it's, it's just a fact. Yeah. However, I don't think that applies to so I, can, I don't know if multiple things could be true. Because even back sure. then, yes, race is always a factor. And as you pointed out in the column, if it's not a factor in this conversation, that would make it the exception in America. That's number one, uh, if not the planet. The only place but in this case, in American life where it doesn't come right. in. Okay. But having said that, and listen, you know I agree. You know we, you know we see eye to eye on on this matter. Like I'm a black man in America, of course I I I, I, I agree with that. But Nikola Jokic was and is a bad. Mother- <laughs> and it's like, this wasn't the great white hype or even the great white hope. This man was every bit as deserving of anybody else of MVP then. And now seeing what he's done in the postseason, I wonder how you feel about that conversation then, seeing what we've seen him do in the postseason with a complete team around him, now that he's the best player in the world. Wow. he's Wow. He's now the best player in the world? He's on the best team in the world, but is who's he, the, well, oh, the I'm sorry. Well, let's back all the way up then. Who's the who's who's the who would you say is the best player in the world right now if not Nikola Jokic? Or is this or am I a prisoner of the moment, Torrey? I don't know if you're a prisoner of the moment, but I mean, so you, you're saying Nikola Jokic is better than LeBron James? Right now, yes, absolutely. LeBron James will tell you that. Yes, right now, yes. All time, no. Right now, yes. Oh, right now, Ooh, okay. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I think with a with with this MVP conversation, as with so many things about race, you could narrow it to a tiny lens and go, "No, I don't see racism." But when you expand it and you deal with actual nuance, like an intelligent person, then certain things start to become clearer. No, so, uh, you know. Tyler Hero is not going to be on the NBA MVP list because he's white, right? Like, that's not mm-hmm. happening. Most of the people who are in consideration for MVP are black. But if you look back through 10, 20 years, 
it's if you're good, it's not and white, that's not enough. But if you're very, very good and white, it gives you a lift. There's a there's a there's a divide in that most of the players are black and right. urban. Most of the sports writers and sports analysts are white mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and generally suburban. And, you know, I think there is a bias that when a white person succeeds, they they may not even realize what they're doing, but they're giving some extra points to that person. And thus you have someone like Steve Nash winning multiple <laughs> MVPs. <laughs> I mean, you know, so... I grew up in Boston. I can attest to the brilliance of Larry Bird. Um, right. Which is Steve who I would Nash... compare Jokic to, by the way. Yeah, but Steve Nash is winning MVPs in a world where Kobe Bryant is alive? Like, what? But, but um, let's see. Okay, so if I, could, if I could interject here, I hope this is a, a oh. good enough point to interject. Here's my issue. So the Steve Nash thing continues to bother people, all right? When... It's almost like there are years where, okay, I don't know it, and Michael, Michael Jordan took that personally. There are years when, you know, Carl Malone won MVP and Michael Jordan di didn't. And we're like, Michael Jordan, like, there are certain players in NBA history who you can make a case could have won every year, whether that's Shaq, yeah. whether that's Kobe, whether that's LeBron, yeah. whether that's Jordan. Yeah. It's like, but so there are other people who had better regular seasons and weren't better all-time players. Steve, I, I, I don't, I've never appreciated how Steve Nash gets shit on because, oh, the Shaq should have won that. And so, I'll, and I'll go a step further. And this is where it becomes not just black and white to Ray, but just color in general. Do you remember the color, the, the colorism conversation um, around Steph Curry when, when he was the first unanimous MVP in NBA history? And there mm -hmm. were people who were pissed that Steph Curry did something that Jordan never did or that LeBron never did and attributed Steph Curry being the first unanimous MVP to him being light-skinned and the light-skinned wow. privilege that he had. And now in hindsight, Steph Curry is one of the greatest players in NBA history and yeah. deserved it and just so happened to be the first unanimous and that became a, a skin color thing. And so the reason why, hey, listen, everything you said is absolutely true in general. And the NBA and basketball conversation should be no exception. So I just want, I want to reiterate that I agree with your overall premise. But in the case of Nikola Jokic, I think it's a couple of things at work here or what a couple of things that were at work. Because, again, now I think it's I think it's clear to most people that he was deserving of being MVP. And that, okay, if you don't think he's the best player in the world, that's fine. He's at least in the conversation in a way that he wasn't before now that he's got a championship and a finals MVP. I'm saying that I think it has a lot to do with Steve Nash, who's the poster child for what you're talking about. And I think the people conflate regular season with postseason still, which really bothers me. It's a regular season award. so Because yeah. if, if Jokic had won a championship, I don't think there's that much – pushback against him winning a third straight if he won a championship before this year and lastly I do think basketball because it's a black sport or in theory a black sport the majority of black players yeah. let's call it that yeah. um, I, it, it lends itself to cultural discussion and debate that oftentimes to your point can lack the nuance or broader understanding necessary to have intelligent cultural and discussion debates because again what you said and the way you said it I had no problem with it what I had a problem with was it became something that um, delegitimized Jokic's validity as a two-time MVP and a worthy three-time MVP as if he were some like I said before some great white hype instead of just one of the best big men of all time which thankfully now we can put that to rest a discussion about how good he is because of what he's done in the postseason. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you know, look, the guy's like the, the the guy's brilliant, you know, and you're just noticing almost every play, he's making it happen. He's making that pass, he's making that block. 
you know, he's he's in the lane and makes them rethink what they're going to do. You know, I mean, he's involved in almost every play and it's ridiculous. I'm not saying the guy's not great. I'm saying that when white players are great and they're close to winning MVP, they tend to get it. You know, it's like if we can give it to a white guy reasonably, he's going to get but it. Torre, but Torrey, but Torrey, why wasn't Jokic yeah. just better than Embiid? Like, why, like, why, why, like, why, why, why can't it be just he? as simple as that? Why couldn't he have had a better look? Jokic isn't on social media. Jokic doesn't have endorsements. Jokic don't even want to go to the parade. He won't go watch his horses back in Serbia. Jokic doesn't give a shit about anything that we care about. He's not warm and fuzzy. He's not relatable. But why? Why is it so far fetched? Was my problem that to me this honestly to me a lot of this discussion came from and not on your part. But ignorance, yeah. because again, you you extrapolated this and made it a, a, an American thing, which is what, again you made it a teachable moment about the truth about American society in general. The people yeah. who were debating this on NBA Twitter and on television, to me, this came from a place of ignorance. Ignorance in so far as like you're not you're not watching Nikola Jokic close enough, because why could why is it such a uh, why is it such a stretch to say that no, he's the best player, he's better than Embiid, or he's having a better season than Embiid. This, I, I just didn't see him getting propped up was my issue. I saw somebody who was damn good. You're right. that They're always going to get the tiebreaker. They're always going to get that tiebreaker. But in this instance, I didn't see that at play. I'm not, saying it, I'm not saying the guy ain't dope. He's clearly dope. But when white players get close to winning the MVP, they tend to win the MVP. If, they can't, if you can vote for them, they're getting the nod. They're getting the benefit of the doubt. They're getting the... You know, six over the half dozen, yeah, a lot, and yeah. that doesn't mean that Jokic isn't great, isn't an all, right. a Hall of Famer, uh, isn't you know an incredible player. You know, but I mean, you know, in a world of Shaq, Kobe, LeBron, they could win it every year, and I think some people find that boring. Right. True. And like, I, and it, I, the boredom was the other factor. I think there was some boredom with Jokic, just like there was with Giannis. There was so mm -hmm. there becomes fatigue. I think fatigue is the one thing I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up in this is that there's fatigue with voting for somebody who again hasn't scaled the mountain. Um, you know, and now that he has, killed me as when I saw a, a, a tweet saying, uh, "Oh, in the end, Jimmy Butler did play like Michael Jordan's son." <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, he was. There was some. There was some serious, uh, some questionable decision making on the part of, of jimmy butler um at the end of that he game but not, you know what? actually he did not show up big in game five like you would have thought and hoped he didn't show up big in the second half of the Celtics series like the way you thought you to show up. like he was self-checked a lot of times he passed up a lot of shots that i was like yeah, why are you he, passing in, the, in this situation there was a like, lot of drive into the lane and yes, then yes, sort of step yes. around and look for who i can kick it out to i'm like why right. isn't he? Wait, did you see the thing that I posted about um, Lowry? I might have missed that, Torrey. Would you talk about well, Kyle look, Lowry? Look, would you look, post? Oh, look on my Instagram. Let's let's talk about it because it's the last it's the last reel on my Instagram <laughs> where I'm okay. like, it it appears to be like the like the brother takes about six steps and then oh the travel. I did see that. Yes, that was definitely a travel. That was definitely okay, a travel. You. But right? okay, it's but like they, yeah, but I don't want to. I, I don't want to talk about the travel. I'm glad you brought up your Instagram. I want to talk about you because, again, like I started off by saying, if where do you find the time where a person? Do you have a full staff that I'm not aware of? Like, how do you find these tweets that you aggregate? Because my favorite thing on Instagram is these like best of the internet reels that you're putting together, like. You like you're constantly, and it's not a criticism. You're constantly posting. So, like, where do you find the time to write books and 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 produce and, and execute podcast series and play tennis and be a dad? Like, what the, specifically? What is your social? How do you social media? Teach me, a wise one. Like, how do you do this? <laughs> I'm serious. I'm like, I'm like, wait, like, how does he do this? I mean, you know, the 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 reels and stuff is fun just while I'm searching, just while I'm scrolling, you know, over days. It's like, oh, that's funny. 
grab that. Oh, that's funny. Grab that. like, you know, I mean, to take 10 minutes and just scroll through TikTok and Instagram and find funny. And you're doing stuff. this yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, part of wow. it is that part of, you know, part of it is that I used to spend a lot of time on Twitter and Twitter has increasingly become a cesspool and increasingly like you're having dumb conversations with right wingers. Uh, so I am increasingly spending less time on Twitter. And that has led to putting, uh, you know, putting some of that time into Instagram and now into TikTok, um, which mm -hmm. I love. It took me about a year or so of sort of just watching on TikTok to sort of understand the TikTok language and to understand where would I fit in this? Because I'm never going to dance. I don't want to be silly. Right. I want to make jokes. <laughs> right. right. But to find sort of the adult wing on TikTok and see how they do their thing, and they're not responding to trends, and they're not generally responding to other people. They're like, I'm going to have an intelligent conversation about racial justice or whatever. And like, okay, that's how I can do it. But also like, you know, as a TV person, first off, I'm like, you know, I got my uh, teleprompter app and I'm doing, you know, 30, 60 second monologues because we could run off 60 seconds without a problem. But mm. I'm like, this don't feel like everybody else's TikToks and it don't have the same because TikTok wants like short bits, like cut up your sentence. Mm. Like, mm. you know, if you're not stopping and like the messiness of, you know, you suddenly move, you suddenly move, you suddenly change, like that's TikTok, right? And we want yeah. that. And it's not as compelling if it's not a collection of little bits that make up your paragraph. So just, just learning that part of the game. Um, and, you know, it's funny too, you know, because the kids are so great because I started doing TikToks. And there was so much about the app that I didn't understand in terms of how do I functionally do this, edit, do like change the time. How do you put the captions on there? And I was about to put out a thing on Instagram or something like, who wants to be my TikTok, you know, like buddy for a minute just to mm -hmm. teach me the ropes. And my 14 year old daughter was like, oh, I know TikTok. I'll tell you. And she's like, so if you want to do this, you do this. If you want to do that, you do that. And this is how you do a green screen. And here's how you cut down yeah. the clips. And here I got the song. And oh, wow. you can't edit. Okay, so you do have a staff. Right. No, but she just <laughs> taught me all the technical things on TikTok. I'm yeah. like, yo, like, this is great. Now I know how to do TikTok. And so, yeah. you know, she, she helped me get up to speed on how to do it. My son, my son is funny because he won't talk because he's like, yo, the Chinese are getting all your information. <laughs> that's your son. That's your oh son. That's, that's, oh that's just no, your no. kid. But you're on Reddit. Like you think they're not yeah. doing the same thing. Or the American government is doing the same thing. You think you really think that they're not coming for your information on uh, yeah. other platforms? It, it, we have funny. He's like, TikTok is wrong. You shouldn't be on TikTok. China's getting. Oh, my God. Dude, but even your captions are many think pieces. I just want to point out there was one line because I'm, I'm swiping through all of them every time you post it on Instagram because it's hilarious. Um, there was a Jordan LeBron tweet and somebody said, until somebody, and they didn't say somebody, they used the N-word, but they said, until somebody get robbed for their LeBrons, don't ever tell me he better than Jordan. <laughs> I was like, I never, why did I think Hell. to use that one? <laughs> Hell yeah. I was like, that was Hell. it right there. But I, I want to I stay with your kids, though, man. Father's Day is coming up. Happy Father's Day. Yes. I love seeing your family updates as well. Wait, uh, how I know old your are daughter your just, kids? My, uh, my oldest is 17. She just finished her junior year of high school. Um, my son, my middle child, is four, uh, 15, I beg your pardon, just turned 15. He's going into his sophomore year, just finished his freshman year of high school. And my daughter, my youngest daughter, is 10. She'll be 11 uh, later okay. this summer. Today is her last day of fifth grade. So, so wait, so she's a, she's a baby, but the other two are teenagers there in the midst of it. Have you yeah. had any they, them, or 
buy or pan or want to change their name or any, any have you is any of that stuff coming up for you with the kids or conversations about it with well with the kids i mean like they're all no not with, not, not with not with them individually but we've just talked about school you know society in general we've had conversations especially with my oldest um but not well, with my them son, individually my son announced that he wants to be they them which I was yeah. like, cool. I'm um, cool, and I'm trying to figure out the language around, like, so, okay, what, you know, if I call you my son, is that okay? And he's like, no, like, try to say, mm. like, my kid or my oldest, so we don't really, yeah. like, okay. I don't fully understand it, but I'm trying to comply with it. Um, Interesting, because my daughter, and I'll just interject real quick to yeah, and, and keep, keep, keep talking about that, but my daughter, she goes to an all-girls school, and mm -hmm. I, I think, well, but I think that's, I just made a mistake. I, th I don't think they call them uh, ladies. I think it's just guys. I think it's just guys. I forget exactly what you're supposed to call like a, a group of, of, of young women. It's, it's, you can't call, you can't, my wife, because she works at the school as well, you can't call them ladies. I, I'm actually getting up to speed. So you want to talk about a child shall lead them or we're learning from the youth? I'm getting up to speed on the proper way to ad address people and, and children in particular when it comes to, to gender identity. But but I'd love I to hear more like, about, about your kid. I, I feel like our generation grew up watching uh, gay and lesbian people have a difficult time, right? Like our peers mm -hmm. were like being shunned, mm -hmm. violence, Ma was it Matthew Shepard? You know, like, you know, we watched, you know, the AIDS crisis. And I think as a generation, we were like, Nah, we're gonna be different. If our kids want to be gay or lesbian, it's cool. Yeah. We will embrace yeah. it. We will accept it. Yeah. And I think most Gen X parents are like, cool. Like if you're gay, yeah. cool, no problem. Yeah. We support you. Yeah. And then the Zoomers come, and they're like, Nah, I'm a demi girl. I'm a they them. I'm and, yeah. and you know I'm this. I'm, and we're like. Okay, cool, but I don't understand what you know. And they're like old dichotomies, right? Like yeah. you know, binaries. And we're like, okay, this is complicated. <laughs> right. We'll be on the other right. side of binary, no problem. Right. They're like, no. And we're like, Wait, what? I don't. I, right. I want to like, be. I'm, I just don't understand. I'm not, I'm not phobic in any way. I just, right. I just, I'm just, I just teach me, just help me. So. That's funny you say that because I do wonder, because um, <laughs> like honestly, let's just share. Let's just share. Um, <laughs> I mean, like when you talk about like the way we grew up, and and not just that we, that we decide that we were not going to be like the previous generation. Like there were mandates in our household to not like one of my mom's rules for me and my brother was don't be gay. <laughs> like that, honestly, that that was that, that my mom. You? Yeah, yeah, that was that was like. But, but you gotta understand the generation my mom comes from, oh, and yeah. she's the the daughter of a of a of a Baptist pastor in the South. Oh. No, as you know, no nowhere is more conservative than the Black Church, and so that yeah. was one of the rules, you know. And so now it's it's like you always. And this is my question for you: You always know how you'll handle it. Like I've thought a lot about. You know how I would handle any of 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 my of, of of my children's evolution and discovery and what have you. It's like so. It's one thing to say, "Well, this is how I would handle it. I'd be cool with it, right?" But then when it actually happens and you have the conversation, what was that like for you? Well, well, I mean, similar to what you. My parents never said that, but I do recall a boy my age uh, got an earring. A little, a little stud, and that my right. parents were like, "Oh my God, what is wrong yeah. with him? Why would they allow yeah. this?" So it was like clear, like that is completely unacceptable as far as my parents. Um, you know, we, you know, he says to me, "You know, I want to be they them," and I'm immediately like, "Cool, yeah," like I'm like, "You like." Right, but I don't, I don't right. really, get it. you know. But then, that is complicated for me. But it's almost easy because then he comes at me and he goes, "Well, I'm a romantic, 
which is the whole thing, a row means I will never experience romantic love. I'm like, huh? You're 15. How do you know? You've not met huh. any. You're gonna go to college. He goes because he goes to a relatively small school. I'm like, you're gonna go to college. It's gonna be thousands of people. Somebody, yeah. male, female, non-binary, whatever, will walk in the room, and you could be like, oh my god, like that person yeah. just blew me away. I gotta know that, like. Yeah. You don't know, but he's like, this is who I... And then he comes to us one day. He was in his room, and we're in the living room, and he comes out, and he's like, I did not consent to being born, and it was unethical for you to have me and to bring me into this horrible world. And I'm like, what All the right. f <laughs> is you got, you got, you got, you got one. You got a handful right there. Oh my <laughs> between God. TikTok and now you didn't consent to being born. You got your He's you got you got atheist. your work cut out for you. He's also atheist, which is, you know, not a big problem for us. Yeah. But I'm like, yeah. okay, so you're just grabbing all the things. <laughs> all the <laughs> Okay. Check it all the boxes. All I, the I've boxes. just preemptively told all of my children, man, like just whatever. Just be just be yourself and be honest around me because like there's genuinely zero judgment. Like I'm not gonna preach one thing about love and inclusiveness uh in the world and not practice it at home. Like I like I, I like that's that to me is the worst thing when somebody is one way in public and then when it when it's in their own home, switch it up. It's like, no, like this is what I believe. And I'm certainly going to be accepting more than accepting, uh, celebratory even of my children being their full authentic selves and being happy. That's all I care about. Like, are you happy? Like my job is to protect you, whoever you are, whoever, yes. you know what I'm saying? Like, I, like yes. once you figure out who you are, I'm going to celebrate that and, and protect you and, and, and whatever that is. I'm down. I'm down yeah. with whatever you want to do. I don't right. necessarily understand it, and I am trying to understand it, you know, yeah. and I think the destruction of the binary itself is complicated for us, right? Mm -hmm. so, it, so I'm trying to figure out, well, what does it, you know, what does it mean? Uh, you know, but I mean, I, I support it, but I am in a process of learning you know right. and then you and i think that's something. that's a support that's an exercise in support like understanding yeah. like i have a lot to learn about how to be respectful in how i speak about it uh how i address you it's like that's that's important that's an important step to take because one thing to just be like because i've always had a problem with the word tolerate because tolerate has a negative yeah. connotation to me it's like yeah. No, I, I'm. I support. I I embrace and I support, and it's part of that. Help me in my growth. Like I'm the one that needs to grow and 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 learn how to discuss, how to address, you know, how to be respectful. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's complicated. I I saw. I saw this right winger talking about this as a as part of social contagion, like they're getting it from each other and I don't think these kids my son etc are doing these things or saying these things to get attention like I give him a ton of attention mm -hmm. like you know you don't need this you know I don't I, you know he I don't think he's doing it for that but you do wonder like where is this coming from what is the what is the I don't get it you sound like the coolest dad in the world again happy father's day like how would you describe Torre the dad? I mean, you know, I love these kids and I just try to, you know, give them the space to be who they are. You know, we as a group are big into playing games and I think we've gotten a lot out of playing games together. Um, mm -hmm. Play a lot of Exploding Kittens. Um, I love that game. <laughs> love Exploding Kittens, right? Wait, you play, um, wait, would you play that with kids, though? I thought that was an adult game. Isn't that, like, you play, no, no, it's you play that with the kids. It's a kids okay. game. Okay, I must, I must be thinking about something else. All right, or maybe there's an the adult version, because I feel like I... Yeah, the card game. Okay, yeah. anyway, keep going. Yeah. So, Swarty uh, Kittens, Monopoly, Scrabble. I try to avoid Monopoly because it's endless, 
right? And Scrabble hasn't <laughs> quite, we played Scrabble a lot with my parents. That hasn't quite caught on. We like Rummy Cube. Y'all play that? Okay. No. Um, I'm trying to just get my kids to learn how to play spades. Just so they, you we, know, because my wife don't know how to play spades. I want my kids to be better. <laughs> we, we did a lot with um, a game called Machi Koro. You ever see that? Okay. Uh-uh. It's sort of like, it, it, it's, it, um, imagine how a Japanese inventor might say, let me take Monopoly and make it better. And then, like, Machi Koro is that. Um, we love Machi Koro. We played that on and off for years. I'm trying to think what else we've dug. You know, like, we've tried things and some things we don't like and it doesn't catch on for us and some things do. We're into this new game that my son asked us to get called Modern Art, which is basically each person is a museum or represents a museum, and we are auctioning or bidding for different paintings and trying to bid up the price, uh, the value of the paintings so that then the, the collection of your art is hmm. more valuable than anybody else. Um, you know, so this has been, you know, just these ways of interacting and playing these games has been really, really powerful, uh, you know, as a way to sort of bring us all together. And, uh, you know, yeah. we love that. I, you know, I've, I've, I always going, say, I'm sorry, we love going to movies. You know, we, yeah. what did we just see? Um, we're going to see Asteroid oh, City Saturday. We just saw okay. Little Mermaid. What's the thing we okay. saw? We also, oh, Spider Man. I think, you know, Spider Man was interesting because. The second Spider Man. Oh, here, here we go. Because I didn't really like it. I love the first. You saw the second Spider. You saw the new Spider Man. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one okay. of the best things I've ever seen. Don't go. Don't play. Tor, you know, Tori, oh, you one of those people. Like again. No, I don't. I didn't. I didn't want to do this. I don't want to do it. You brought the shit up. I was not going to bring up your. So I get a text from you saying Guardians of the Galaxy Three was terrible, and it's it like was. okay, and then I go see it, and it was. Thoroughly enjoyable. And I'm not saying Marvel bats a thousand. Oh, by the way, I got something for you to read. Did you read the New Yorker piece about how the Marvel Cinematic Universe is like swallowing up Hollywood? It's like an origin story and it's about like its struggles and inside Marvel and just what it's doing to the industry. You would love it. I'm not saying Marvel bats a thousand, but I've learned as much as I respect your opinion about 99% of things, you have no talking about when it comes to comic books or Marvel movies. Spider-Man wow. Across the Spider-Verse was a work of art just like Into the Spider-Verse was. Okay? And Marvel wow. movies, like, you haven't even seen them all. And you haven't. And if you haven't seen them all, you're just qualified for the conversation. It's like talking about Nikola Jokic without watching Denver Nuggets games. It's the same shit. Well, wait a minute. It's like, wait, a minute. Like, wait a minute. It's the same do thing. I have to watch, do I have to watch 82 Denver yes. Nuggets games to understand... Oh, okay. <laughs> no, <pro> okay. touche. <laughs> right? Touche. I, mean, like, touche. <laughs> I don't like. I, you know, I, I didn't see touche. Iron Man. Yeah, I, I walked into that one. <laughs> Ant Man. Two. You know, I'm not a but casual. You know, but, but you, with you, you, I'm not you a can't nerd. Can't be a casual. Like you, I'm not a it's casual. not for casuals. It's not but for I'm casuals. But I'm not a casual. I'm not a casual. Yeah, you I are. Think if you funny. haven't seen funny. every Marvel movie, you qualify oh, as a casual. No, 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 no. Stop it. I'm like probably. I'm probably at like. 80% of MCU and I probably have to count to see if more but I'm like Ant-Man 2 like you know not do Doctor Strange 2 like uh, eh, right but like but you, you know, but they all build all on one another one. okay here's a better one you wrote a book can I can I, can I read the I'm, last chapter of your book and missing, write a review it's not that I'm missing Toray. references Toray. That, Toray. That, I, that, that I don't understand Spider the first Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse was very direct and precise in its story. There was a clear purpose. There was a clear star. He goes on a journey. It was incredible. He comes back. This one, first of all, there's no ending. What the? F there's not a clear to be the continued. Really clear. Part two. What's is wrong with that? He the star, or is he the star? It's not really clear. What is the journey? Thirty Cold minutes stars? in, I was like. Wait, I'm like, wait, first, uh, 30 minutes in, I was like, what do they want? Where are they going? Oh my God. Like in a movie, you'd be like, the character wants X. So if we just stopped after 45 minutes, you'd be You're like. worse than Martin Scorsese, I swear. He didn't get 
X. No, I'm not Scorsese. I'm watching these movies. I'm not hating on them. Some of them are great. Some of them are not. Yeah, I want to know what does the character want? If you if we've been watching <laughs> 30 or 40 minutes and I can't tell you what the main character wants and what is the hurdle to getting that, then I'm like, wait a minute, where where are we going? And there are occasionally movies where there isn't that sense of purpose and it works. But the spider, I'm like, okay, now you're just giving me great visuals and lots of other spider people. And I'm like, but where are you going? But what even if you have a, okay. So what I was about and, to and say he was. Went two hours and 20 minutes. And I don't mind the length. Move. But okay. you couldn't resolve it in two and a no. half hours? No, they couldn't because we got to come back for more. Okay. Listen. I'll come back for more. If I'm at Spider Man 2, you will get my money for Spider Man 3. I'm coming back no matter what. You don't need to give me a cliffhanger and come back in two years with the rest of the story. Finish but the story. You, I'll come back for the next one. But see, here's my thing. You, like, even if you I have mean, a point, that, wait, 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 wait. Let's say so you have a you point. Accept not finishing it as a commercial decision. It's because it's clearly not a creative decision. Because we could have wrapped well, maybe up the story in half hours. Maybe it is a creative decision. I mean, it, there's it, no creative uh, need. Uh, it, to, it, to, Infinity to War and Endgame. Infi Infinity War and Endgame is one film in two parts. It's one saga no thought. No thought. in two parts. No yes, it is. It's no thought. Kill Bill it's two, is one Kill film Bill is in two parts. Right, and Infinity that was War and vision. Endgame is 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 two is is two movies. It's one saga. Okay. It is one it's, battle. It's one saga. It's one saga that one we've saga, been following yes. through twenty five films. Right, like it, no, it's surely no, one no, no, film. no, no. It was a build up to the 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 one. But I'm saying like Infinity War was a each to be of those continued. Films, when each they, of when those they were films all disappearing, its own movie. Yeah, Each but it's still a to be continued. It's still no, to be I don't continued. Have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with the to be continued, but Infinity War ends. I have a resolution. Resolution is very important in art, right? The whole of art, music, oh, okay. visual, whatever. Tell me more. Is, <laughs> is create, create tension, right? And then give me resolution, right? Create tension, give me resolution, right? Mm -hmm. Infinity War it ends it has a resolution even as it says we'll be back with more in the next in the next film Fine. you saw it well, as a resolution them disappear it wasn't ending there it wasn't going to end with them just disappearing and them just like oh my god what just happened that wasn't the end of the movie it was the end of that part it was the end of the story it was the end of the movie not of the story so maybe you didn't like the execution of spider-man but here's my larger point i was gonna say I can't read any of the last I can't read the last chapter of any of your eight books or skip around and and give a and give a, a qualified intellectual credible book review if I only read the last chapter. So what I'm saying is even if you have a point artistically which I respect about any of the Marvel movies or in this case the uh the Sp the MCU movies or in this case the Spider-Man um franchise the the Miles Morales franchise I can't take it seriously because you haven't seen them all. And whether or not you think you get the references or not, the context, you're missing the context and you're missing the payoff because you haven't I'm, seen them all. I'm, and we've argued like about said, this for years. I but like can't I said, take you I'm, seriously I'm like, if you haven't I'm seen like them all. 80, I might be 90% of Well, that ain't seen enough. This, this, this MCU cycle, right? I might 80, 90%. Like I've seen tons of these films. Like I said, it's the, it's the, it's the second Dr. Strange and the second Ant-Man. And, and the, they're not like, all great. They're not all great. Love and Thunder was one of the worst things I've ever seen. They're not all know, great. I, I'm not caping up. I'm not Captain caping Marvel, up pun intended I, for the MCU. I mean, like, look, nothing in Ant-Man 2 and Iron Man 3 makes better or resolves the reason but why we three but some things are necessary in, some things are necessary in, how do you feel about ending, season two of the wire watching them sit around and mope that half the world is dead <laughs> i did not need three hours of like the boredom that like we can portray in art boredom oh in an interesting way they were bored mm. in a boring way and i'm going 
this sucks. And now when we get to the final fight, the final fight's incredible. But why you said we're going to kill the villain right, easily right away and then give you two hours of them sitting around of like, I'm bored. Let's see. Maybe That's I'll go back and see my father. Maybe we, I'll go. the like, same movie. Oh, we you don't, could, you like, don't even get what some, happened. You can see my father. You don't even know. You are you are a super fan, and you will accept that's that's whatever it. they give you. That's it. Thank you so that's much, it. sir. May I have no, another? No, that's not true. That's not You're true. Not I critical. just said Love and Thunder was terrible. I didn't like Shang Chi. Oh, There's a lot of things I didn't. I haven't liked that Marvel has done. But okay, let's move on. And I want because there's a couple more things I got to hit with you. I, I I knew I was gonna be all day with you. I'm thank I'm glad. Thank you for the time. One thing we agree on is succession, which is really a father, which is a great fa Father's Day viewing, because it's really right. a lesson whether you're rich or not. It's just to make sure your children. Your goal should be just don't let your children grow up as <laughs> Kendall. Uh, Roy and Shiv, yeah. uh, Roman and Shiv. <laughs> okay, yeah. just make yeah. sure that that doesn't happen. Um, I, I, I wanted, I've been wanting to talk to you about the finale and yeah. whether and how you're still processing and what are you doing with your Sunday nights now that we don't have succession Sundays? Uh, well, right, right now, nothing. I mean, like, you know, to have a have an appointment show is rare yeah. now, right? Like, I like the me, my wife and I. 900 on the couch watching succession as it rolls out week after week. And we were there from season two. Season one, I checked out, she stuck yeah. with it. A friend, yeah, I didn't love it at first. I didn't I didn't I didn't get it at first. Yeah. Um yeah. a friend of ours was in season two. Actually, two friends of ours were in season two. So we were like, all right, let's 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 get into this because we want to see our friend and support our friends. And then we were like, yo, this show is the sh. Um, <laughs> the finale was brilliant. Yeah, I love the idea that you know these three need to make a decision to save the company, to save themselves, keep it in the family, and they can't do it. They can't come together. Save their I can't lives. believe Shiv went out like that. I can't believe Shiv like when when Wait Shiv found out that that it was Tom, she looked like she was about to go scorched earth. For Shiv yeah. to then, I, I I get the sibling rivalry. They're probably the the line that summed up the series. I love you, but I cannot stomach you. It's like for her to hate Kendall so much that she would give the company to for, and Matson and Tom. Is like just to be his trophy wife. When when you could have undermined Kendall, just keep the company and undermine Kendall. Play the long game. Why well, did you, how, how she go out like that? Barely touching his hand in the car. I can't. I, I still can't get over that. She she hates. It's part of like a presidential election. It like who do I hate less? Who could I? Who could I stomach <laughs> right more? Yeah yeah. I don't like I, either of these. I rather I rather the husband who I'm dysfunctional with. And the, and the guy who sold me out in my own flesh and blood. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot. It, it, it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter that it was Tom. It doesn't matter that, that it was Matson. She doesn't love Tom. She doesn't even like Matson. It can't be Kendall. Right. It can't it's, be. It's, it's, it's anybody I but Trump. You. It's, it's, I don't it's think never you. It's never Trump. Do. Never, never Kendall in this case. Yeah. I don't think <laughs> yeah. you would do a good job. Yeah. It can't yeah. be you. And you killed somebody. And the, yeah. eventually that's going to come out and you're going to. Like, no, I didn't. That it, didn't happen. That didn't happen. That, right. My favorite There's part was when nothing. Roman flipped. He was like, wait, that was a move? No way, man. Whoa. No way. <laughs> he was like, no way. There's nothing pro Tom or pro yeah. Shiv, what she's saying. Yeah. She's not calculating, well, at least it's my husband. It, yeah. that, that does not matter. It can't be you. Yeah. And, you know, Ro uh, 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 Logan's last line to them is so important. I You're love not you. serious people. Yeah. Not serious people. And that was a, in a that's way, my fantasy football team name, not serious people. Shiv, Shiv, both Shiv <laughs> and uh, Kendall embody that in that moment. In like, she's like, You're not serious enough to run this company. But also, She's not serious enough to do what they need to do to keep it in the family. And then, of course, Roman comes in.
with the racism of like, well, your kids aren't <laughs> white. They're not right. in the bloodline and one of them's not even white. So, yeah. which obviously he didn't say that, but he didn't need to say that, right? We know what he's really saying. Yeah. You know, I, I thought it was, I thought it was, it was, it was brilliant that, you know, it was like a potato sack race and they're at the finish line and they're about to win. And Kendall's like, just one more step and we win. And Chip's like, no. <laughs> and they all fall down and they're like fighting each other at the finish line as yeah. Tom quietly just walks past them to win. You know, it, it was it was brilliant. I thought, I tried to think beforehand, they're going to choose the person who is least likely to win. Kendall is the, is the front runner, so it won't mm -hmm. be him. Shiv would yeah. make sense, so it won't be her. I'm like, it's going to be Rome. And I thought in the conference room, as Shiv is laying out the argument that it can't be Kendall, she was going to yeah. say... I can only support him, right? Because it can't yeah. be me, because Kendall won't yeah. su something like that. And like, can we support Rome, right? Can we yeah. And and but obviously that didn't happen. Um, right. I thought it was We're brilliant. All bullshit. It was brilliant. All One of the great shows bullshit. of our time. Now, can we? Can we? The recency bias is very high. Can we calm down? This is not the greatest television show of all time. The Wire, Breaking Bad, and Sopranos still exist. This is one of the great yeah. shows of all time. Yeah, it's, this it's is not in the, the conversation. greatest show of yeah. all time. No, it's not the greatest. It's in the conversation. No. It's in and the we conversation. saw some of that. This is the greatest show of all time. Like recency bias. Please chill. The Wire still exists. Breaking Bad still exists. Sopranos still exists. Well, I mean, if you don't mind, I, I would like to call Being Black the 80s one of the best podcast series of all time, if I may. I, I appreciate that's recency bias. You. No, appreciate but I'm so serious, dude. So it's like every time I think it's Black Music Month, which every month is Black Music Month, same as Black History. Yes, um, amen. But it's Black Music Month officially, and if you're going to celebrate Black Music Month, I implore you to listen to Being Black the 80s as part of the Griot Black Podcast Network. Every time I think, oh, this is my favorite episode, but then I get to the next one. I was like, shit, this is even better. <laughs> it's like, because oh, like at man. first, the, you know, the Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos mass incarceration Public Enemy episode. I was like, "Oh man, this is this is the best episode so far." Not that the other ones weren't great, you know. Not 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 that the Tracy Chapman episode wasn't great. Not that um, you know the crack episodes weren't great. But then I get to Mass Incarceration. I'm like, man, this is the one. But then I get to Stevie Happy Birthday, the real mm -hmm. MLK, and it's just the way that you took, as you said, not the best songs of the '80s, but the songs that reflect and speak to the issues of the decade best was just so brilliant to take the song, deconstruct the song, but then really give like, as you, as you said in, in the write-up about it, you know, the funkiest history class ima imaginable. Like, this shit should win awards, and I'm not just blowing smoke, bro. This is, this, is, this is some incredible, incredible work. I wonder, you said you wanted, and so we got the, Being Black, the 70s coming up, and then the 90s yeah. coming up, can't wait for that. So I guess the questions I, I just have for you on Being Black, the 80s, it's just... Uh, the, your inspiration to do it, um, I've already said a million times, where do you find a time? Your inspiration to do it, but also just like uh, some of the stories behind the stories, maybe what's on the cutting room floor, what songs didn't you unpack or deconstruct or issues did you, like, it just was so well done. Uh, and even why you started with the 80s, is it because you're an 80s baby? Just, I, I love to just I mean, get inside you know, this, po this podcast I process. I mean, I've been trying to do something like this for years. And the nature of podcasting does not, economically does not generally allow you to do something that is hugely time consuming. Uh, you know, this is, that's why most podcasts are improvisational, two people just talking. The Grio so great in saying, okay, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, I want to do this podcast. And they're like, great, go do it you know, here's some support, go make it happen. And I was like, wow, like you're comfortable with me doing pretty much whatever I want here? Like, yeah. But, you know, I have always believed that great music contains the seeds of the time that it comes from. And especially black music is quite often inherently political, even if it's not mm -hmm. overtly political. And like yeah. Tracy Chap, as you said, hard. black black joy is political. That was one of my favorite lines as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, you know, Tracy Chapman's "Fast Car" is not a 
is not an overt protest song. She's just telling mm -hmm. you what is going on in her life and this desire. And it's actually not, I don't think it's a song about her. I think it's a story song about a character. But she's talking about poverty and the, the emotional things that people in poverty need in terms of self-esteem and escape. But it's not an overt protest song. But I think you can look at it and say there is an element of protest, an element of, you know, self-esteem, an element of escape, the desire for these things within this story. And so I wanted to just dive into important songs and talk about some of the big issues of the time. The, I, we started with the 80s because the 80s is such an important decade as far as what happens politically. The Black working class and poverty class expands, but also the Black middle class expands. So mm -hmm. we're going in two directions at once. Crack has this massive impact on the, on the community. You know, I think from about 84, 85 to about 92, crack has a massive impact in terms of where the money is going, uh, you know, losing people's lives, the rise of crime and the homicide rate and the impact on lots of babies, uh, you know, the impact on the criminal justice system in terms of people being arrested, you know, the 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 sentences going into what we now call basketball uh, sentences because this, the numbers that people were getting would look like basketball scores as this massive impact. So we have two episodes that are dealing with the impact of crack, affirmative mm -hmm. action, Afrocentrism, mass incarceration, you know, the MLK holiday. There's all these big things in black America. Right. Gay liberation, the, women's it, liberation. Yeah. Yes. And they are reflected in the songs that we, that some of us made NWA. Public Enemy, Tracy Chapman, De La Soul. So I wanted to link these issues and talk about what's going on in Black America and what I see through these songs. And, you know, it was a joy to do, and it was a joy to sort of dive into the songs and talk about, you know, the songs and these issues with people. There was one commentator in the issue, in the episode about gay liberation that really blew me away, that he came out to his father when he's around 10, in the mid to late 70s, probably the mid 70s when disco was still rising. Late 70s, disco was this insane national phenomenon. Everything is about mm -hmm. disco in the 70s, but mid 70s, still rising. He comes out to his dad and his dad is like, sure, cool, but like, I don't know of any happy gay adults. And the son is like, wow, that is a lot to take in. And then with the rise of disco, he's like, yo, I'm seeing lots of happy, authentic gay adults. And it made me feel more comfortable to come out and be myself. And this is partly how in the 80s, you see this mass coming out, this mass sort of rise of gay liberation, this battle for gay liberation. And, and disco is part of that, and it's not the whole of it. There's people in the street. There's people, you know, in state houses and legislatures who are fighting. But disco is part of that rise. And so we try to talk about some of that. And the message is disco is all about self-esteem, self-love, joy, accepting yourself. And these messages are critical to a community that is struggling to be itself, you know, so yeah. incredibly important, uh, you know, and we, we try to chart these messages. You know, I, I had a great time making the De La Soul episode where he focused on my brother's a bass head, which is a yeah. true song. Positive Noose's brother, older brother, was a crack addict. And the yeah. family's going through it. And Prince Paul, who's considered like the fourth member of De La Soul, their producer, he's mentioned on all the records and stuff. He's talking about like positive news came in, his family had been going through it. He knew exactly the record he wanted to make. You know, the late Chugoy was like, yo, here's how we can add in a church service within it, which to me speaks to how traditional institutions were like, we don't know how to deal with crack because they came right. on so hard and so fast. People were like, right. how, how, what, do, what do we do? How do we? And it's right. interesting. This, not in the episode, but 
criminologists are like, we're not really sure why the crack epidemic ended. It was not because of policing. It was not because of the war on drugs. The yeah. best guess is that the next generation was like, yo, that shit looks whack. Being a crack mm. addict does not look cool. Mm -hmm. Smoking marijuana can come off cool, right? Like cool people do it. You can do it and continue to be a creative person. You continue yeah. to be a professional person. But being a crack addict, you lose your life. You're scratching. You get sores. You kind of, you just kind of become right. like the dregs of society. And people were like, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to be yeah. part of that? So it doesn't perpetuate beyond that seven, eight year stretch from the mid 80s to the early 90s. But, you know, one of the things in, in I do an episode based around NWA's Dope Man. Dope talking Man, yeah. About, that, that was a great juxtaposition between that and- Thank you, talking about so. what the drug dealers are dealing with. And yeah, they're evil, but I'm like, we got to grapple with what impact did all this have on them and on and what impact did they have on the, on the community? And right. one, of the, one, of my, one of my longtime friends, Samson, who's a great journalist, we were friends from BET, talk, and he was in the street heavy. You know, he was dealing, he was robbing drug dealers, he got shot, he went to prison, he was all part of the life. And he talks about, like, you know, you couldn't really show people your emotions. You didn't want to right. seem happy. I, I enjoyed that part, yeah. Or weak, you know, or mm -hmm. dance to be hard. really that much. You didn't yeah. want crew, another crew, your girl, another girl who's looking yeah. at you to think, oh, he's soft. You want to be yeah. hard. And I think yeah. that became a prevailing vision of manhood for a lot of us. And I was obviously yeah. never anywhere near the game, but that notion of this is what it is to be a man oh, yeah. yes. down even yes. to yes. us. And yeah. you know, Royce of Five Nine in my in in my episode talks about going to his grandmother's funeral and wanting to cry and couldn't, not being able couldn't, to couldn't summon. Couldn't summon it, yeah. And you know, when my father passed, I didn't cry, and I was mm -hmm. waiting for it to come. And I felt sad and depressed, but I never outwardly cried. Like I think if you had seen me that like week between like learning about it and then you know the funeral, you would not have said, "Oh, he's different." Like it was happening internally. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I kind of put it on my dad, too, because I remember I was like 10 when his mom died. And I remember asking my mom, is he going to cry in front of us? Because he was very stoic and I think sort of relatively narrow emotionally. Right. And, you know, we get angry like men can get angry, but we don't have a full complement of emotions the way women are are able to do express a full complement of emotions. I was like, yo, is he going to cry? Because I don't really want him to cry in front of me because because I'm, you know, because I see him as a sort of Superman. And, you know, and she's like, I don't think he's going to cry in front of you if he does at all. So I'm policing my father's emotions on the death of his mother, right? right. And communicate with right. my mom, which I'm sure she kind of was like, you know, just don't cry in front of the kids because they don't want to, like, wow, like, it would have been really valuable for me to see him cry and let yeah, me example, know it's okay yeah. for a man's man, and he was a real man's man, to cry. And yeah. when he passed, I didn't, I didn't cry, you know, because it's. I think it's suppressed so deep in me because I was taught this is what being a man is. And I think that is not effective for us as men, but, you know, that's what we learn. And, and the whole drug dealer thing, is part of us learning that, uh, you know, but also the guys talked about, you know, the economic impact that they had on the community, right? They had all the right. money. Hip hop. Good. Yeah. Right. What, what, what so is hip hop like, without the drug game? What is hip hop? So what they're like, we like that business. So we'll support that business. We like that kid, you know, so we'll give him money to stay out of the game. You know, we like the yeah. Rucker tournament or whatever. So we'll support that. The things that they didn't care about, didn't get supported. They inspired yeah. a lot of people to be entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, they talked about, you know, 
when LL or certain other people needed, you know, to do a video, <laughs> borrow our right. cars, borrow our jewelry, jewelry clothes. So there, it- I mean, I always knew that hip hop was seen as the top of the style pyramid, but they were following yeah. the drug dealer. They were dressing yeah. like dealers they saw with yeah. the ropes and the sweatsuits and the shoes, right. et cetera. So, Even you know, LA style dealer. was, yeah, it was very much based on what the drug dealers were wearing. So they had a massive impact on the community. So I'm just trying to make, to tell those sort of stories through the lens of the songs. And, you know, it's and, interesting. And you're the only person, you're the only person, honestly, it's right, that, that could have pulled that off, man. Like you talked about manhood, like, honestly, you are the man. Um, and get, I'm telling people, or anybody listening to this or watching this, listen to all episodes are available wherever you get your podcast. Being Black the 80s. Look for Being Black the 70s and 90s are forthcoming. Subscribe to and listen to Torre Show, um, where he talks to his guests about their road to success and how Being Black Yo, shows up in their tell work. Him, go back and listen interviews. to the episode we did because it was dope. You kept it real. We went in on again your past, your future. Yeah. You know, all the things yeah, you told me. That was one of my, one of my first long interviews after, after yeah, I left kept, ESPN, I want to say. You kept it yeah. really, really real, and it was beautiful. Yeah. It's always good talking to you, man. Uh, I could talk Thank to you, you forever about anything except, except Marvel. Marvel. That's it. That's the only – anything else I'm feeling. Hey, man, happy Father's Day to you. Uh, all the happy best Father's to the family. To you. I love you, brother. Keep up the great Thanks, work. Brother. Keep informing us. Keep enlightening us. I always learn something when I listen to you and I talk to you. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you.